and I go to run this, and regardless of the error that it gets, if it gets the null object exception, right, because I put valid numbers in, or the invalid cast exception, it gives me the same error message. Why? Because my try-catch doesn't differentiate between those two different kinds of errors. I'm simply saying any error, do this. All right? And therefore, I can't write a more descriptive message there because I don't know what error happened. All right? However, I can catch specific exceptions. All right? And I could do this, for example. I could say, whoops. Catch ex as invalid cast exception. If I do that, then I know I'm catching that the values were invalid. So I can put in here. specific error message because this code is going to handle just when there's bad data in there. This will handle every other exception. Okay? So if I go and run this, if I put in good numbers, it'll tell me there's an exception. Why? Well, this code throws an exception. It's not an invalid cast exception. Therefore, this line doesn't take effect. But it is an exception. Therefore, this line takes effect. All right? Exception is any sort of exception. It's sort of the parent object for all exception objects underneath it. So since I did not get an invalid cast exception, this more generic exception gets caught and processed. Now, if there was a third or a fourth or a fifth sort of exception, this code would not differentiate between any of them except the invalid cast exception. The invalid cast exception gets treated differently than other exceptions. So at this point, for my code that catches the exception, I don't know what the exception is. It could be anything. Now, in this case, I know what it is, but if this were a program with a lot of other things going on, I wouldn't necessarily know what that is. All right. If I go back here and I do put in bogus data, I get the error message that says must enter numeric values. Why? Because that specific exception was an invalid cast exception. Therefore, this catch caught it and not this catch. All right. What do you suppose will happen if I remove this code? I remove, remove the catch exception. What's going to happen here? Blow up. When will it blow up? Only if it's not an invalid cast exception. If it's not an invalid cast exception. Right. So if I go and do that and debug this again. If it's an invalid cast exception, my code catches it. If it's not an invalid cast exception, it blows up. Because I'm catching the one kind of exception, but I'm not handling... Well, why is that an error? Why is that an error? Well, just had. Oh, well because, no, because, because you nullified. Because I know okay. that, I'll know about that object, right? So it's not giving me an error on that calculation. It's giving me an error on this line. All right. And again, you know, you just know that the try, uh, the try block, the error could be on any statement within that try block. Now, ideally, what you would want to do is every exception that you would expect, you'd write a catch for. So in this particular case, 
I could expect a invalid cast exception and a null reference exception. Is there a way to find out all the exceptions that are, are available? Is there a way to find out all the exceptions available? <clears throat> there, that probably is documented what objects and functions throw what exceptions. However, when you start looking at not just a couple lines of code, but several lines of code, there could be a lot of exceptions. So you'll sort of know the kind of exceptions to expect. All right? And if you write any custom classes, you can throw your own exceptions, and you'll know which ones to, to expect. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to write code for the two exceptions that I know, and I'm going to write code as sort of a catch-all to catch anything else. Set it to nothing. But how would you do that accidentally? Uh, you know, when it, when Remember, this is a very contrived case okay. for me just to demonstrate errors. Yeah. So, yeah. Why would you null something out? You'd null it out uh, if you no longer needed it. And because um, objects stored in memory um, you know, are, take up resources. So if I no longer needed it, I would null it out. Now, if I null it out then, if my code isn't smart enough to realize that it was nulled out, then I could have nulled something out and not realize I nulled it out and then try to access it later. So, yeah, uh, again, keep in mind that the errors in this case are very, very, very contrived. All right? Um, you know, I'm trying to break it here. And I'm trying to generate a couple of kinds of errors. All right? But, again, what I've done... So to summarize, as I have my try block, I've written specific exceptions for the ones that I know could happen that would exist. Now again, in this case, the, the, the deck is stacked, right? Because I know I'm anticipating these exceptions. In other cases, you might know the exceptions you're anticipating based on, um, oh, we'll play around with the database, all right? When we do the database, maybe we can have a more realistic example of this. I'll do something evil like start to do an ad, then I'll rename the database and see what happens. All right, or delete the database. That might be that might be able to give us some different errors. All right. But the bottom line is, you know that there could be some sort of of errors. In this case, I'm saying I know that I could expect this error and this error. Therefore, I write catches for it. And then I write sort of a catch-all to catch anything else that I haven't explicitly caught. So I can go and run this. And now, if I enter invalid numbers, it tells me I nulled out an object because it got that exception. If I type in garbage numbers, it tells me you must enter numeric values. Now, if there was a third kind of exception, if I generated that, it would give me the generic exception message. All right. So that's exception processing in a very contrived case. This exception processing will be part of what we're going to do with databases. And we'll, we'll take a look and, and we'll, we'll do some more stuff with it. We'll, we'll play around with it. Um, as we do this. Now, here's the code that I wrote, and, and I'll demonstrate it, and then, then we'll examine it. I click run here and go to the default page, and that's not the page that I wanted. I want this to be my start page. The second link here takes
takes me to an ad that doesn't use a grid, uh, a grid view or a details view, but rather uses a form that I made myself. So it's pretty simple, but we can expand on it. So I click on Add with Handmade Form, and I get very bare bones, first name, last name, and the faculty rank. So I type in Joe Smith is a full professor and click add and it adds Joe Smith who is a full professor. All right. So that's what that does. Now it did it without using a details view. This is a form that I made on my own. All right. So let's look at the code that does this. All right, let's go and look at the ad. All right, first of all, if we were to look at the code of the ASPX file, there's really not a lot there. I have my form. I have ASP.NET text boxes for first name, for last name, a drop down for the faculty rank, which I have bound to a data <coughs> source. And that's about it. If we were to look at this in design view, you'll see I have my text box, text box, drop down for faculty rank, an add button, a error message uh, string or label, and then I have a data source to supply the values for the faculty ranks here. All right. So because I'm not using the built-in controls, I'm using my own code. For one thing, notice that it makes this page a little thinner, right? I'm not using that code unless I'm actually adding it, so that, that those objects don't exist just sitting out there waiting. All right, so it makes, makes for maybe a leaner program. All right? In addition, if I was defaulting fields from other places, then this might be a good approach. All right? At any rate, let's look at the add functionality. On my button click event, I have if is valid. What's the purpose of that again? What does if is valid mean? Yeah. If all the validations check. If all the validations check. Now, I don't have any validations in this case, but I probably should. <laughs> all right. I think I deliberately omitted the validations. Um, just so we could test some error catching, all right? See what, what particular problems that we have. All right. But at any rate, keep in mind that your validations fire off both on the client and on the server side. And while the validation should take place on the client side and prohibit this code ever from executing, if the client had JavaScript disabled, then the, the validations would run on the client side and therefore they would run on the server side and catch any validation errors you have. All right. What I'm going to do now is those very objects that I used for database connectivity with the grid view or details view, I'm going to create now, except I'm going to create them on my own. I'm not going to use the GUI to drag it over and create it that way. And notice I don't have a details view or a grid view. You know? Those are controls, and they come associated with overhead. You know, the, if, if we were to measure the amount of resources that this takes as opposed to, say, a comparable form that uses a details view, you'll see this one would be much, much thinner code, all right? much less resources. So I create my SQL data source object using that line. I set two attributes of that. And what I'm going to do is, let's drag this over this way. I, so I, I, I uh, set the provider name. Whoops. Oh, that wasn't good. I set the provider name and the connection string by pulling values from the configuration manager. 
Where do you suppose that configuration manager is going to get the values for these connection strings and provider name? Web.config. From the web config. So I'm, I'm telling it to pull from the web config file the provider name associated with this connection string and the connection string associated with this connection string. So these two statements are the statements that point this SQL data source to the correct um, to the correct um, database. I then create my insert command. Insert command equals insert into faculty FF name, FL name, F rank, values, question mark, question mark, question mark. No FID in here, right, because that's an auto number field and that will automatically be generated. So I don't need to include the FID in the insert. I just need to include those, um, those values that I'm actually inserting. All right. I then can create my parameters for the insert. And we'll go right down the line. FF name, FF name, FL name, FL name, F rank, F rank. And I supply where I'm going to get the values for those parameters. So I say insert, add parameter, FF name, and I'm getting the value from it from the first name text box. Last name, I'm getting the value from the last name text box. Faculty rank, I'm getting the value from the selected value of that dropdown. Okay? So I'm writing my own code to fill in these parameters at runtime with the location that they come from. Now again, I could have my try up here, but really, this is the only statement that I would qualify as dangerous, all right? Because a lot of things could happen. I could be violating some constraints of that table. Uh, the database could be down, all right? Any number of things could go wrong with that insert statement. Therefore, I know that that's a potentially troublesome statement, so I will include it in the try block. So, objds insert, what does it do? It executes the insert command, filling in the parameters with the values of the parameter. If it works, then I'm redirecting the faculty maintenance. If it does not work, I'm generating some sort of error message. And again, a good error message will uh, give the user a sense of what happened, you know, a sense of, you know, if there's anything the user can do about it, or should the user simply try again later, or alert the system administrator, or whatever. I could put any number of, of there's any number of options of what I could do here if there's an exception. I could write to a log file saying that there's an exception, that, that such and such exception occurred on this date, on this time. And with this exception object, <laughs> I have a lot of the technical details that the user might not care to see, but might be meaningful to someone trying to debug this. So I could, again, you know, write those technical details to a log, and that, would, that might help someone trying to debug this. Obviously, or maybe not so obviously, I wouldn't want to write those errors to a database table. Why not? No, that's not really it. If you can't connect to that database. Yeah, if you can't connect to the database, then you can't connect. If you can't connect to the database to do the update, you might not be able to connect to the database to write your error message. So therefore, I'm going to simply spit out maybe to just a flat file an error message. And again, that still could go wrong. Let's say if, if your, your disk was full on a machine that was a web and database server, you can't create a flat file either. But at least, hey, you know, 
that's about the only thing that could go wrong, or one of the only things that could go wrong that would prevent you from just spitting out a short explanation to a flat file. Now let's go and let's let's play around with some exceptions. All right, let's go and <coughs> let's go and run this, and let's not add <coughs> a first name. All right. And it gives me an error. It's not necessarily a good error, but it does give me an error. All right. Now, one thing I would suggest you doing when you're in debug mode, in other words, when you as a developer are working on this, notice I have a second error label where I can put more detailed error messages. All right. So, What I can do here in my ad is, if there's an error, I can actually pull the message from the exception object that will give me great detail about what's wrong. Now again, what I would suggest is to suppress those error messages uh, once you get into production mode. I would just use this in debug mode as a way for me to, to see my user-friendly error message side-by-side side with the actual complete error message from the database. Oops. So now if I run this, Go into here, leave that out. I see the user-friendly error message along with an OLADB exception. You must enter a value in FL name field. So let's write down that exception. Now let's try this again, but let's let's play dirty. Let's go in and move the database somewhere else. So I'm going to cut it from here. I'm going to paste it on the desktop. So it's no longer where it's expecting it, right? So my connection string should fail because that database isn't there anymore. Let's see what error we get here. I still get an OLADB exception, and that's, that's unfortunate, all right? Because what that means is I can't really differentiate between uh, the different kinds of errors in here. So I really just have to take my best shot at, at giving uh, a generic uh, description for that. It says could not find file. Yeah, it, it does say that, but notice it's the same exception. Yeah. Oh, so, yeah, uh, can't so I can't write a different catch. I could include this. All right. I could, for example... Let's look at some of the other properties of the EXC or other functions. I could include the message. Let's see what that does for me. Oh, now this guy's going to blow up. find it for the drop down. I have to time that just right to, to get the error. Let's do the other error then when I leave out a field. Alright. Well, 
Well, that might not be too bothersome. Let's enter a value in the faculty FL name field. But I sort of would not want to report that to the public because that gives them insight about what my database is and what things are called. And they could possibly re uh, reverse engineer that and do some sort of SQL injection attack or, or something like that. Or they could attempt that. So I'm not going to display that error message. I'll, I will just make sure that the user-friendly error message I display is one that is beneficial. That being said, this sort of message is very valuable in debugging. So therefore, as I'm working through a program, I might include that message. Or I might write that message to an error log that um, only a system administrator could get to. So how did you, could you go back to the code that generated that mm -hmm. secondary and that highlighted? Yeah. So it's... I just said exe.message. <coughs> Associated with any exception, there's a two string, there's an inner exception, there's a message that, that shows different pieces of information about the exception that just got generated. And while I would not necessarily want to display that to the user, it certainly can be use, uh, useful in terms of debugging. So when you did the first one at an exc dot two string, yeah, two string that gave me a more detail. The whole, the whole yeah, thing. that gave me a more this detail. Just gave you the basic this just gave you the basic one, okay. right? Now, again, the advantages of this is this is a this this is a less resource intensive page. <coughs> all right, I um, the the SQL data source only exists for as long as this function is running, as opposed to the other one where the SQL data source lives for a long time. All right? The couple of text boxes and buttons and drop downs that I have on this page are thinner, less resource intensive than a details view would be if I chose to do that approach. And as an extra bonus, I can default some values here if I can pull values from other places. For example, let's look in the faculty table. And one of the attributes for the faculty table is date hired. All right? Date hired. Now, Let's say we want to add the date hired to the new faculty person that we've just entered in. And guess what? We want to make it today. We want to default it. We don't want the user to have to enter that in. Now I realize in an actual application you might not get around to today to process paperwork from yesterday, so you might want the ability to enter that in, but let's say we don't. Let's say we want to default it to the current date. What I could do is something like this. I could go in here and I could alter my insert statement to say date hired Oops. give another question mark and then add another insert parameter of today to that. Let's see if this works. And the today is automatically generated by the system? Today is a, is, is a, is a ASP.NET or a VB.NET, I'm not entirely sure, function that gives you the current date and time. So let's go and run this. And let's enter in Fred today. That's a full professor. We click add and if we go and look in the database